Hello everyone and thank you for joining Suzy's State of Consumer Webinar Summit. It's been another crazy year here at Suzy in 2021 as we've once again tried to navigate the unpredictable winds of this overall business and economy and society um, while trying to take care of our employees and most importantly deliver for you, um, our consumers and the Suzy community overall. Um, I am Matt Britton, I'm the CEO of Suzy, and I must say that over the last year, it's been continually encouraging to see the practice of consumer insights gain more and more importance and gravitas as something that companies are investing in. I think so many leaders are seeing right now that the best businesses are ones that are truly consumer centric, that have the customer at the core of every decision they make. And we're thankful to have a product in Suzy that can real, really help companies in sort of enabling and embracing consumer centricity. For those of you who don't know what Suzy is, it is a real time market research platform that enables companies to tap into an always on network of over a million US consumers to help test any decision across the product development lifecycle from from insights to innovation, the package testing, the concept testing, uh, Suzy is used uh, across all those use cases, across a multitude of industries, and it's a business that continues to grow. And um, we're really excited uh, to be able to serve you with a whole new slew of new features and functionality in the Suzy product uh, as we head into the year 2022. So enough about Suzy, and let's talk a little bit about the consumer. Uh, we conducted through our Suzy platform a study on U.S. consumer uh, throughout the days of August 4th and 5th with a sample size of 1,000 Americans, directionally representative of U.S. consumers working from home and census-weighted across age, gender, ethnicity, and region to really try to put our finger on the pulse of what is the state of the consumer right now? What are consumers thinking and feeling as we head into the fourth quarter, 2021, and really into a lot more uncertainty. This was a fall where we thought that we would be kind of heading into some sense of normalcy. We thought that, you know, the pandemic with the vaccines getting distributed at scale across the country would allow consumers to come back in the fall and go back to school and go back to work the way they'd remembered in 2019. But unfortunately, that hasn't happened. And because of all this uncertainty, 2021 has really had the most stress reported in the last 15 years. Some are surprised by this because people would have thought 2020 would have been more stressful. But the reality is that 2020 was more of a state of shock. Consumers were hit with a shock wave of the, something called a pandemic that they never thought of before. 2021, we're facing really a consumer that's quite worn down and fatigued through all the ups and downs of this pandemic. And because of so much uncertainty, stress has really started to hit the consumer in a way that we really haven't um, you know, experienced before. And we're seeing a lot of employees walk off the, the workforce and say, you know what, I'm just too burned out. I can't work anymore. Mental health issues continue to peak amongst consumers. So it has definitely been a very stressful year, but not all was negative uh, when it relates to 2021, and we're going to be going into that uh, today. Again, a big cause of the stress right now is really this dichotomy of thought. Um, are we still in a state of pause? Or should we be pushing to return to normal? Obviously, we're seeing this play out across a divided nation in the political spectrum when it comes to schools and masking in schools and companies and companies opening offices. So there really is so much confusion. And again, we were all hopeful that this confusion will be over by now, but that obviously is not the case. One in two people feel that their emotional state has been impacted by the recent rise of the Delta variant. Um, again, this is something that we had never thought of, that not only would we have this COVID pandemic, but then there would be variants of the original virus that vaccines uh, would not be able to effectively uh, you know, defeat. And because of it, we are now seeing a whole new range of uncertainties. And some people think that after this variant, there's just going to be more and more variants that are going to make it harder and harder for consumers to go on with their normal lives. And let's all hope uh, that's obviously not the case. Companies are really following suit. Uh, Amazon recently announced they're pushing back the return to office until at least January, uh, which raised questions about the pace of COVID recovery in Seattle. And we're seeing this play out over and over in major cities around the country and around the world where major employers are now slowly just inching back their opening dates just because they don't really have a lot of confidence um, in what the state of the, the healthcare system um, and obviously the, the medical system's ability to defeat the pandemic is. So 
we don't really know what 2022 is going to be even um, at this point. Um, and then we're seeing some companies really trying to still be creative uh, with commercializing, for lack of a better term, uh, the ability to be able to drive business growth out of the pandemic. Crayola is a company uh, that has been very creative as they always are, for example, in making up a variety of fun masks for kids to wear when they go into school. Uh, almost every state across the country right now is mandating masks in school. So why not make that a part of the a kid's routine, a part of their fun? Um, it's really, if you take a step back, how crazy it is that all these kids are going to school wearing masks in their formative years in their lives, five, six, seven years old, and they know no other way. So I don't look at this as a negative that Crayola is rolling out masks like this. I think it's a great thing. And I think a lot of companies now have sort of settled into this quote unquote new normal, which is a term we're still saying, and are trying to figure out how to make the best of it and obviously how to, how to drive their business along the way. So we're going to be diving into how America is feeling today. And our team here sort of came up with this concept of looking at the way that consumers are feeling through Maslow's hierarchy of needs. As we all know, consumers have general need states um, that basically they have in terms of existing and surviving. And those need states start with safety, you know, the ability to keep yourself and your loved ones safe. Second, uh, on on that overall pyramid is love and belonging, really the need to connect with one another, uh, to, to be able to feel that you belong in some type of group, and within that group, to be able to feel and give love. Third is esteem, really your ability to feel, feel confident in your own right, to be able to get out and, and try to accomplish something with some sense of self-esteem which is really the gasoline behind accomplishment in, in either your personal or professional life. The fourth is about aesthetics, how you look. It's really an external validation to the rest of the world. And the very top of Maslow's hierarchy of needs is self-actualization, your ability to actually be able to achieve something, to actually have an impact or purpose in the world and actualize your ethos of self into some sort of externality. So I wanna walk through these hierarchy of needs, starting with part one, safety needs, and talk about how those needs are or are not being met right now by the consumer, again, is impacted by the current state of COVID-19. So again, part one is safety needs, the security of body, of employment, of resources, of morality, of family, and of health. How is, is the safety needs uh, really being, uh, you know, delivered on by businesses and how are consumers think, feeling about their own personal safety? One of the first things we've seen relative to safety and the consumer is many consumers really not feeling safe in high density urban environments. There's been story after story about the demise of major cities, which I personally do not think um, has and or will happen. But, you know, the data really doesn't lie that Many consumers um, have moved out of high density areas like San Francisco and New York for greener or, or, or larger, more private pastures uh, in suburban areas because they many times associate dense areas with lack of safety. Obviously, that's driven first and foremost by the pandemic. If there is a virus going around, when you're on top of people, when you're in public transportation, when you're in busy street corners, your chance of catching this virus is much higher than if you're in your suburban backyard. Um, and that's really what drove the initial exodus out of cities. And since then, some of the economic uh, you know, issues that have faced many of these cities, whether it's lack of tax revenue, which has resulted in lack of police forces and things of that nature, have really caused an onset of crime in cities, especially in places like public transportation. So all those things combined really have hit at consumers' core need, which is the need to keep themselves and their families safe. And it's no you know, coincidence that we've seen part and parcel with that a massive rise in the increase in home prices. Why? Because home and safety have always been connected. Uh, as, you know, it's really one and the same. And as consumers have put their personal safety front and center, they've put their home and their own personal space front and center and have spent more money than ever before, not only on homes themselves, but on furnishings and Pelotons and, and a variety of different types of technology and furnishings and accoutrements within the home so they can feel that consumers can feel that they are safe within their own individual abode and don't have to rely on going out and, and kind of rubbing elbows, so to speak, with other people at the risk of their own personal safety. 
Um, I mentioned earlier that you know public transportation, especially in places like New York, have seen a rash of uh, recent crimes. And because of that, and because of the fact that many consumers have moved to suburbs, we've seen a renaissance in the auto industry in the United States. Uh, the surge in car prices actually made some used vehicles at certain points worth more than new, new, new vehicles because new vehicles were so hard to get off the supply chain and consumers were so thirsty to buy new cars, they would actually pay more for used vehicles something we would never imagine it happened. And I actually think this is exactly what the auto industry needed. I think the, the surge in new demand for the auto industry um, combined with a new wave of interest in green and electronic vehicles uh, really stands to reverse course some of the huge challenges that the automotive industry was facing for so long because you have to remember in 2019, many thought that the auto industry was on its way out because Uber was becoming so popular with millennials and as millennials urbanized and, and went to cities, Consumers didn't think, younger consumers think, didn't think it made sense for them to buy a car. Uh, you know, the ease and ubiquity of, of Uber uh, combined with the savings and gas, tolls, parking and insurance made many consumers question, will I ever need a vehicle? And now it's kind of made a 180 and so many consumers, younger consumers, millennial consumers are interested in buying vehicles once again. Uh, so this is something that I do think will be a longer term trend um, as consumers do seek out more space and move to more secondary or tertiary cities or suburban urban environments. Um, two thirds of consumers are actively thinking about their personal safety right now as a result of, you know, everything we discussed and many business opportunities have and will continue to arise out of this uh, company called Simply Safe uh, recently just planned expansion after a $130 million investment round There's more and more consumers not only want to invest in the, you know, internal accoutrements of their home, but also want to protect their home and invest in home security. So home security is something that's growing in importance and platforms like Simply Safe. Uh, you know, deliver upon this, which is why there's so much demand for services like that. Uh, nearly 60% of consumers are still playing the limit activities with large groups of people. I was in an NFL game this past weekend. There were no concerns about 60,000 people filling up a stadium in Philadelphia. So there's still no shortage of people that are willing uh, to go out to large stadiums and large events. But, you know, there are still more than half of people that still say, you know what, I'm going to at least think about it. I'm going to limit those activities as a result of the headlines and what people are seeing. Um, as we look ahead, nearly three quarters of consumers say they put non-essential travel on hold due to the Delta variant. So, you know, we were hearing in the April, May time period, all this noise about the, uh, you know a huge boom and, and renaissance in travel. And for a while, uh, heading into Memorial Day, we did see that. But since the rise of, uh, of the Delta variant, since um, airlines started to mandate mask wearing, many consumers have started to think twice about travel. As we look towards the busiest travel season of the year, the holidays, um, over a quarter of consumers have put a hold on holiday plans for December 2021. Now, we didn't say cancel their plans, but they are certainly rethinking that, rethinking um, trips and, you know, are more and more consumers going to be hesitant to take their family to Disney World uh, this upcoming Christmas season? We'll have to wait and see. Uh, but obviously, this is going to have quite an impact on the travel and hospitality business um, and in a negative way. And potentially a continued positive boom on industries like the auto industry and, you know, uh, home furnishing and home technology industries, companies like Simply Safe and companies like Sonos and Pottery Barn and Williams Sonoma, etc. As again, consumers in their push for personal and family safety really put the home in the center of their investment strategy. Um, the second part of Maslow's hierarchy needs about love and belonging. It's about the sense of friendship, intimacy, family, and a sense of overall connection. Obviously, this is core, and this is something that so many consumers had a huge void in during the pandemic when they were left to their own homes, uh, not able to go into an office every day, not able to go to bars or nightclubs or restaurants or travel the way they used to. And for people, especially who were single, there was a huge void in love and belonging and really overall community. Uh, you know, the, the lack of community uh, that you experience when you don't get to go into an office every day or you don't have a routine where you're seeing your local um, barista every day on the way to work or the, or the person at the bodega um, who sells you a bagel every morning, you know, that really can take its toll on people. And uh, obviously it takes its toll on people of all age. I think especially uh, children who really have never had to experience something like this, obviously, and really don't have a, a 
the good enough senses about them to really be able to negotiate what's actually happening. Where adults, I think, understand the gravity of the situation, but nonetheless, for everybody, um, you know, there's been a huge uh, void in love and belonging. Um, we've seen some companies, uh, you know, really rise as a result of it. Bumble, a dating app that went public earlier this year, uh, continues to go strong as consumers um, have adopted online dating and online um, connectivity, um, you know, in terms of meeting new people as really the core way right now uh, for couples and, and, and new people to get together. And, you know, this is one of those industries that has been catapulted through the pandemic and really will probably change the way that humans meet one another forever. And companies like Bumble and Match Group really are at the center uh, of this revolution in online dating, something that was once taboo and really looked at as not the safest way to meet people is now sort of the commonplace way for consumers to connect. Weddings are back. Uh, we heard a lot about sort of the impact of existing marriages from the pandemic. What hasn't been discussed nearly as much is the boom of weddings that came out of the pandemic. Many people who might have been on the fence really start to realize that, listen, I, we don't know where the world is headed. But what we do know is the sense of connection is so very important. So we're going to put marriage front and center. We're going to put starting a family front and center. Uh, there's a, a whole new wave of COVID babies coming uh, into the world, which, you know, we talk about baby boomers right now and how um, after the war, there was a huge um, boom in, in, in uh, newborns after soldiers came back from the war. I wonder if 20, 25 years from now, we're going to be talking about demographic changes as a result of this pandemic, because it was really something that impacted all consumers. So it really had the, the ability to move the needle in a big way for consumers. And, and the wedding industry is one where putting safety aside in terms of people going um, into these large weddings um, and, and, and fearing you know infection at these large weddings, consumers really uh, within themselves really are putting marriage uh, front and center. And I think that also comes with, you know, Adventure is something that in some sometimes with consumers is sort of the anti-marriage trend where when consumers were traveling more, they were getting married less because they just didn't want to really settle down. But now since they're being forced to settle down, again, they're putting that love and belonging front and center. So it's certainly been uh, quite interesting to see. Uh, the third part of Maslow's hierarchy of needs is the feeling of respect, self-esteem, status, recognition, and freedom. Um, it's really the ability for you to have um, the wherewithal to start to, to go your own path and, and start to understand that your dreams are able to become a reality without esteem. That's something that really doesn't exist. And, you know, many consumers gain their esteem from financial security. And what we've seen recently is that consumer confidence in the U.S. has continued to rise. More and more consumers are starting to feel confident um, about the economic environment moving forward. Now, you know, we, we all know that we're in a very fragile economy, um, one that has been propped up by government stimulus. But at the same time, when people are getting raises, when the stock market is going up as it has been for as long as we can remember, um, more and more consumers really don't think about the fragility of the economy and more get emboldened by what they're seeing in front of them. And we're seeing that play out with things like, um, you know, the bubbles and things like NFT prices and, and the prices of baseball cards and, and cryptocurrency and so many of these trends that are happening where consumers think that these things are going to go up and never going to go down. And because they have high consumer confidence, they're going to keep spending money. Unfortunately, we all know how it ends, but nonetheless, consumers are feeling quite confident heading into the fourth quarter um, in terms of their own economic environment. Um, I read the other day that there are more open jobs right now than there are unemployed consumers in the United States right now. So although the unemployment rates still haven't fully come back from the pandemic, what has come back and then some is the demand for new workers. And that's something that you know we think is going to continue as uh, companies really see so many new opportunities in this new world. And again, you know, the trillions of dollars of stimulus that's been imparted into the economy is going to last for a while in terms of the demand that's coming from consumers and that's going to trickle up um, to businesses who will then need to hire as a result. We talk so many times during our state of consumer webinars just about e-commerce and how e-commerce has been changed forever as a result of the pandemic and this brilliant stat from Bank of America that shows an eight-week period um, from March to April of 2020, uh, you know, there was an 11% rise in overall e-commerce penetration amongst consumers 
a bigger than there was a rise from the 10 years prior. So two months uh, of growth equal to 10 years prior in e-commerce as consumers suddenly found themselves in a situation where they were not able to shop um, at, at stores and they had to buy really any product or service that they may have in the past online. Um, some companies obviously took this as an opportunity to redefine their business models. Uh, I, f I find it fascinating that a company like Nike said, okay, we know the consumers are online. We knew that Amazon is the default way where they're buying almost anything right now. But at the same time, we at Nike are a lifestyle brand, a brand that has been around for longer than Amazon has. And we know that consumers are going to buy our product no matter where it is. So what we're going to do is we're going to pull our products away from Amazon and only allow our products to be sold directly from us on Nike.com. Uh, and that was it was fascinating to see uh, Nike do that. And it, what's interesting is Apple actually did the opposite. Apple for years did not allow their products to be sold on Amazon and then wanted to have that volume and wanted to you know, have the convenience of the consumer and start to sell some of their products um, on Amazon. So uh, you know, it's interesting. Those are two of the most prolific brands of our time, uh, Nike and Apple, and they each look at Amazon differently. But it just goes to show you that this whole rise in e-commerce is allowing companies to really rethink their go-to-market strategy. And again, this endless sort of um, consumer confidence and spending power uh, really has helped companies do so with tailwinds and with the ability to know they're going to continue to drive growth. Uh, the shift to online hasn't just impacted, um, you know, durable goods, whether it be sneakers or electronics, but also consumables, uh, food, beverage, CPG companies now are understanding that what the pandemic has done has accustomed consumers to buying everyday low involvement category products online. And we're seeing the boom of companies like Instacart um, and Drizzly, which is an alcohol delivery service that was recently purchased by Uber. Um, Postmates, which was also purchased by Uber. Um, you know, these delivery services, uh, GoPuff is another huge uh you know, startup that just got valued at over $10 billion. Um, and the, all these services have one thing in common. They allow consumers to buy uh, these household goods online. And now all the large CPG companies are trying to figure out what do we do? How do we merchandise in an online environment? Uh, you know, because we can't necessarily lean into getting more shelf space at Walmart and Target or being in the checkout aisle. We need, now need to speak to consumers directly. Uh, so many CPG brands um, like P&G, uh, Clorox, that you know the list goes on and on. Have and this is from a from an article on Ad Age have started to kind of uh, you know deploy a variety of different tactics to collect first party data from consumers. Why do they need first party data? Because up until recently, if you sold soda or you sold shaving cream or you sold ice cream uh, or any type of cream, <laughs> you never really needed to know who your customer was. All you need to know is how to get more shelf space at Walmart or Target or CVS because that's where consumers were buying these things. So you didn't need to know who the consumers were directly. Maybe you needed to know what the general demographics were for advertising standpoints. But in terms of first party data, Joe Smith, 123 Main Street, New York, New York, you really didn't need to know that and you really couldn't do anything with that data. Now it's completely different. Now companies in a push to drive direct to consumer sales in a drive to be able to better profile consumers and target them directly have no choice but to collect that first party data to be more efficient in their marketing and advertising and really be able to uncover insights um, from consumers uh, the same way that Suzy allows companies to do the same. So I think you're going to see a continued push from these consumers, again, driven by the, the, the rising esteem of consumers, given the, the bubbling uh, tailwinds in the economic environment. To, to really double down on these direct-to-consumer tasks. We talked about some of the bubbles that, that we're seeing as well. Uh, this was a shocking stat to me that more money has been poured into stocks in the last five months uh, than in the last 12 years. Now, this was as of April, but these the, you know numbers have only continued to go up, which is artificially inflating the stock market, which I think is going to face... Um, some headwinds in the fourth quarter um, because I think that it, it it's definitely inflated as of right now. And the big reason why is from platforms like Robinhood, which really have taken advantage of consumers' esteem, of consumers' um, consumer uh, confidence and gamified the process of them spending money on stocks and pouring money into stocks at, at arguably inflated prices. So um, again, when consumers are, are confident, it could be great for the short term, but in the medium term, it could always backfire uh, due to bubble-based environments. 
two-thirds of people feel they have the freedom to make decisions they want. Again, with a lot of consumers, um, you know, freedom equals financial freedom and the ability to be able to buy what they want go where they want, live the life they want to live. For many consumers, it means not working. We heard about the great resignation and how more and more consumers right now are really rethinking uh, their career choices and and how they spend their time and their days. And you can't do that without freedom. And again, the government stimulus that's happening right now, um, also combined with record high savings rates that we've seen with consumers through the pandemic, have given consumers a sense of freedom. So, you know, we're seeing throughout these Maslow hierarchy of needs, you know, so far what we've gone through is that consumers want safety um, and they're going to spend to get that safety. They want love and connection and they're putting, um, you know, their deep personal, interpersonal relationships at the forefront. And they're feeling good about themselves because of the financial economic environment that's happening. Um, part four is the pursuit of beauty and creativity. Um, and what we've seen right now is that it really has impact it how people feel about themselves our research shows that are 40 percent of women say uh covid negatively impacted how attractive they feel but only um 26 percent um, of men uh were negatively impacted but what we are starting to see now is consumers left to their own devices despite how they feel are putting their personal aesthetics front and center when it comes to fitness um, and being in shape. Platforms like Peloton have obviously been a huge beneficiary um, of COVID uh, as consumers have started to put um, you know, the health front and center. Uh, so whether it's the growth of supplements and vitamins or of in-home exercise equipment, I, I think the notion of being healthy uh, has forever been elevated in consumer psyche, given we've lived through a pandemic where millions of people around the world um, have died because of it. So I think that we're going to continue to see health um, and safety and, you know, continue to pop up. Plant-based foods have continued to grow in popularity, um, you know, platforms like uh, Beyond Meat, uh, where consumers can taste what they believe is in their mind is regular um food, like your meats, which is actually completely plant-based. And they the technology with these platforms is really incredible. They, the scientists that they've been able to deploy to, to make these types of foods really fuel, fools the human brain into thinking that you're eating steak when it's really something that's made um, out of plants. And this obviously could have huge impacts long-term on the food and beverage industry, and hopefully on, on the health of America, which has really struggled with an obesity crisis for decades right now. So this, along with, again, personal um, fitness, have been two things that have really boomed as a result of COVID as consumers put aesthetics front and center. And now as stores begin to open up a little and consumers you know, get out, we are now finally starting to see a rise in the real aesthetics, which is you know the luxury goods and the clothing and the makeup and things like that. Armani, uh, for example, bounced back from the pandemic and their sales rose in the front half of the year over 34%. Uh, I was in Soho a couple weeks ago, so lines around the corner in front of Chanel um, you know, uh, luxury store as more and more consumers say, you know what, I'm ready to get out again. I'm ready to look good again. I'm ready to buy luxury goods and luxury clothing to present myself aesthetically. So I think the pandemic sort of took a storyline where at first consumers focused more um, on their on their physical aesthetics, meaning um, I'm going to I'm going to feel good. I'm going to be in good shape, etc. And now it's sort of the external aesthetics in terms of the hair and makeup and, and, and the clothing uh, that consumers uh, want to purchase. So when they start to turn on the lights to the real world, which is slowly starting to happen, albeit not the rate we thought, um, they can do so in a way that makes them feel good about themselves. Um, and the fifth part, it's self-actualization. It's really at the top of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. What we've seen throughout history is that when people get to a place of self-actualization, where they're able to establish their safety, where they're able to have those deep personal relationships, where they feel good about themselves, where they're able to manifest how they feel good about themselves to aesthetics and how the world looks at them and then ultimately actualize their ethos of self. Those are the people who really tend to be the happiest, who feel like they're making the biggest impact on society. And that's really the top of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And a big part of that is travel. Uh, what we've seen throughout the pandemic is although more and more consumers um, kind of shied away from airline travel, many veer towards platforms like Airbnb where they can rent out another home, go on a road trip, go to cities and, and, and places they've never been to before. Um, and it allowed homeowners really to take advantage of you know this massive demand um, in 
going and staying in other people's properties. And Airbnb has been a platform that was popular before the pandemic is even more popular now, and I think will continue to rise. And it's important in pop culture and society as more and more consumers redefine what it means to travel as domestic travel continues to rise um, in popularity and wallet share versus international travel where that threatens maybe consumers notion of safety because they don't know uh, wh really what's going on outside of America right now with you know the wide ranging state of the virus. So Airbnb is a platform that really helps consumers gain that self actualization through travel through adventure, something that they've had such a void in um, and really is, is stands to be a winner in any type of environment. Um, remote learning um, and, and the notion of skills-based learning um, really isn't just for kids. So many consumers uh, with really so much more time than they ever thought they've had have really tried to uh, improve themselves by learning a variety of skills through platforms like Skillshare. You see here the e-learning market is expected to reach uh, you know, nearly $200 billion by 2028 as more and more consumers learn how to do things like coding or learning a second language or learning graphic design or learning a wide range of skills that they may have always wanted to know but really never had the time to learn. And now as more and more consumers uh, are not going to work or saving time commuting or, or traveling um, less, although it's starting to ramp up again, uh, they have went to platforms like Skillshare to be able to learn, to be able to improve themselves, uh, maybe to make themselves more marketable to corporate America coming out of this. Um, and that is a big form of self-actualization. So we talk about travel, uh, self-actualization, the notion of adventure. We talk about learning or enrichment um, as another form of that as well. Um, I also think just general competencies and, and giving yourself the tools to be able to do the things you need to do um, has been another huge um, you know, trend coming out of the pandemic that I do not see stopping anytime soon. Uh, we talked a lot during the pandemic about the DIY market. Uh, and DIY doesn't just mean fixing you know, your, your uh, shower, shower handle or, or fixing the tiles on your floor. Sure, home improvement is a big part uh, of, of DIY culture, but DIY also means consumers have learned how to groom their dogs uh, because they couldn't go to the dog groomer during the pandemic, or they've learned to cut their spouse's hair um, and because the, the, their spouse was not able to go to the salon and get their hair cut during the pandemic. Um, so there are so many everyday skills, everyday uh, you know, tools that consumers never thought they had the need to deploy in the past. But now when left to their own devices, what they've had to learn is how to do it in, on their own. And they've gone to platforms like YouTube. Uh, you know, I think so many brands have kind of gone by the old Lowe's uh, tagline, you can do it, we can help. Um, you know, being an enabler, the notion of an enabler brand. And the best brands I think during the pandemic have used it as an opportunity to push out content to make consumers' lives better and to teach them and to empower them. And sure, you can weave your product into the message, but I think this sort of DIY revolution is just getting started. And I think more and more consumers um, now have been conditioned to try to figure out how to do things on their own. We've also reached this age of, you know, ultimate activism, uh, for better or worse, and we've seen it play out, obviously, on both sides of the spectrum uh, during the pandemic. A big part of self-actualization is communicating to the world what matters to you most. So whether it is about um, you know global warming or whether it's about uh, government reform or whether it's about racial inequality um, or whether it's about you know caring about a trend that some, that's going on in the world that you see but nobody else sees. We're seeing stuff like that in TikTok play out every day. Consumers now have time to research and go deeper into the topics and causes uh, that matter most to them and have now the time um, and the wherewithal to become activists. And activism has become really a, a you know a, a big trend that we're seeing. Um, you know, we're seeing kids in schools in, in middle schools walk out because they don't like what, how the administration is handling an issue. Obviously, we're seeing companies, uh, you know, the employees at big companies really speak with their feet and walk out or not work or whatever it may be. They feel like they're not being treated right. So we are sort of going back to a 60s style age of activism amongst consumers, but it's, it's being driven um, really through consumers having the resources and the knowledge um, to really be able to become activists and really at such an early age. And again, that's a big part of self-actualization 
socialization is really imparting into the world what you think and feel um, about society at large. So, you know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs is something that has been around uh, since the dawn of time. I'm sure it wasn't that it was not old, but it's been around for a very long time. And uh, it's it really never goes away. You know, these are the needs that consumers have to live happy lives. And the pandemic has really impacted each and every step of this pyramid. And businesses really across this overarching cycle of needs have found ways to plug in and meet the needs of consumers. And, and, and I think, and I often get asked from brands like, what should I be doing right now? And I think now more than ever, what's clear is we have officially crossed over the chasm from an advertising-based society to a content-based society. Meaning when brands used to have to build their brand and get consumers to know about them and buy their product, it was about promoting their unique selling proposition. You know, 50% uh, more exorbitant, 50% more ha horsepower, whatever it may be, whatever those unique uh, product-based selling propositions, and they would push those selling propositions down the throats of consumers through running TV spots over and over and over again. Well, those TV spots were watched on linear television, and now we're in a world where everything is being streamed. Um, so brands no longer have the ability to impart their messages on the consumers. They need consumers to seek out something from them, seek out something that adds value. And what we've really identified through this presentation is so many areas where consumers have voids in value, where they need brands to fit in. Brands need to now flip the briefing process from how do we push our unique selling proposition through an advertising-based environment to how do we add value to consumers' lives? What does our consumer care about when they wake up at six o'clock in the morning? And what are their unmet needs? And where can I fit in? How can I add value? How can I help them? How can I assist them? How can I make them laugh, cry, smile, or share? Something that adds value to them and I can put my brand in the center. And in this world where we've really just stripped down almost any sense of normalcy, we're really rebuilding uh, from really a raw place with our consumers with these core needs. And I think that if you can start to think of the consumer as a person, as a human being, not just a number or another data point and figure out what their needs are and where your brand can fit in, then you will be able to uncover the gems of your brand to really deliver on the needs of the modern consumer. And I'm hoping that our tool, Susie, and our, our amazing team can help you all do that. Uh, we are really passionate about helping brands um, really tap into human understanding to understand what their consumer is thinking and feeling. My experience is so many businesses really get lost when it comes to understanding the consumer because they have short-term pressures and they try to um, you know, change consumer behaviors in a way that's really not in touch with reality. And really what we see on the screen right now is about as in touch in the reality as it, as it gets. So um, I hope that this presentation has added a lot of value uh, for you today. Um, we still have a ton of, of great content to share and we will continue to create great content because it's something that we and I personally love to do. I love to, first of all, get on stage. I love to see people in person, but short of that, I love to get in front of the Zoom and, and record a presentation like this and really try to help um, our customers and the Suzy community at large really win in business. So uh, on behalf of the Suzy team, I'm Matt Britton, founder and CEO of Suzy, signing off. Thanks so much for joining today. Take care.